right, welcome to First Chapter Friday. My name is Lucy, and the book that I'm going to be reading, the first chapter of today, is called The School for Invisible Boys, and this is by Sean David Hutchinson. This is a story about an 11-year-old named Hector Griggs who discovers that he has the ability to become invisible. It comes at a time when he actually sort of wants to disappear. His best friend has all of a sudden started bullying him because of something that Hector said to his best friend. And then the way that Hector acted against that caused his best friend to get even meaner. So he is really feeling lonely and sad and sort of ashamed about that. He lives with his mother, his stepfather, and two stepbrothers who aren't always so nice to him. And he's running away from the ex-best friend when he discovers what it is that can make him turn invisible. Then Hector meets somebody else who can turn invisible, a boy named Orson. And we start to learn why they are turning invisible and what is really going on and what the greater thing that is happening at Hector's school really is. And it's pretty adventurous and it involves some monstrous characters and a lot of different middle school students. I'm going to read the first chapter of The School for Invisible Boys. The dedication of this book says, for all the librarians and teachers who made this invisible boy feel seen. One, I loved to run. I never felt so free as when I was racing the wind with the sun on my face and no particular place to go. Running from my ex-best friend because he was dead set on trying to tie my legs into a square knot didn't fill me with the same exhilaration. You're roadkill when I catch you, Hector. I thought of at least three devastating comebacks to shout over my shoulder, but I needed to save my breath to stay ahead of Blake Nesbitt. He loved to run too, and for as long as I'd known him, he'd been a little faster than me. It had started in the locker room. I'd just finished changing out of my school uniform into my gym clothes when Blake attacked me for no reason. I was so surprised that I stumbled to the side which was the only reason I managed to avoid his punch. I couldn't believe that Blake was actually trying to hit me. I'd never seen him hit anyone before. I turned to the other boys for help, but they looked away like they were too scared to get between me and Blake. With no help coming, I made a break for the door. The moment I hit open air, I put on a burst of speed and sprinted toward the PE field, looking for somewhere to hide. I couldn't let Blake catch me, or I was a goner for sure. I could run for the bleachers, which wouldn't offer much protection or try for the trees at the edge of the field. But if coach caught me there, Blake would be the least of my problems. There was one other place I could hide. Behind the field stood the old clergy house, a two-story building with filthy windows that screamed, I'm definitely haunted. It was the last original building from the 1950s when St. Lawrence's Catholic School for Boys had been built. There were rumors of a ghost that lurked around the old clergy house and I was a believer as were most of the boys at St. Lawrence's. Under normal circumstances, I wouldn't have gone within 10 yards of that place, but I hoped Blake's fear of the ghost would keep him from following me. When I reached the building, I skidded to a stop to catch my breath. Hector, over here. Then I stopped breathing. The hot, humid air grew chilly. The skin on my arms turned to chicken flesh and the hair on the back of my neck rose. I looked around to make sure it wasn't another boy playing a prank on me, but I was alone behind the clergy house, as far as I could tell, and I didn't recognize the voice. It grated across my ears and felt like an itch in my brain. Hurry up, Hector. I was imagining things. That had to be it, because the alternative was that the ghost at St. Lawrence's was talking to me and knew my name. A shout from the field broke me from my stupor. Blake was getting closer. I didn't know what to do. Follow a ghost I couldn't see or take my chances with Blake. I had no idea what the ghost wanted with me, but Blake's intentions were pretty clear. This way, Hector. I chose the ghost. Quickly but quietly, I crept around to the rear of the building, sticking close to the wall. When St. Lawrence's was founded, the clergy house was where the priests lived. Now the school used it to store desks, textbooks, sports equipment, and whatever junk they didn't need at the main building. Not that I'd ever been inside. It was strictly off limits to students. Derek Boyd swore he'd snuck in once and that he'd seen spiders as big as football scurrying around and slimy black mold growing on the walls. Derek also claimed his sister was an android, his parents were international art thieves, and that he'd caught a great white shark while fishing at the beach. So I doubted he'd actually ever been in the clergy house. It didn't look like I was getting in either. Both the knob and the deadbolt above it were locked, and no matter how hard I shook the door, it didn't budge. 
If someone's there, please let me in. Shutters covered the first floor windows, probably to keep out kids like me. I was toast, the kind that's so burnt you can't save it no matter how much peanut butter you cover it with. A wave of hopelessness washed over me. It was like someone had scooped out the happiness inside me and left me empty. I wanted to quit. Blake was gonna win anyway. In fifth grade, I'd been taller than Blake, but he'd sprouted a few inches over the summer, leaving me the runt of the sixth grade litter. He was bigger and stronger and faster than me. I should give up now. There was a click, and when I looked, the deadbolt was unlocked. What the? I reached for the knob again. You're dead, Hector. Blake Nesbitt burst into view around the corner. I didn't think, I just ran, but this time I wasn't fast enough. I made it as far as the field before Blake caught up to me. He tackled me from behind. We hit the grass and I barely had time to flip onto my back before he was straddling me, pummeling my stomach and ribs. I was so shocked that he was actually hitting me that it took me a second to remember to defend myself. I know it was you, Hector, Blake spit the words, his rage accelerating them to the speed of bullets. I struggled to get free, but I was better at running than fighting. And look how well that had gone. I didn't do anything. There was no way I could escape, so I did my best to protect my face. You burned my science project, Blake shouted. Musser gave me a zero because I had nothing to turn in. The boys from the East and West sixth grade classes gathered around to watch Blake clobber me. A few even cheered him on. I kept hoping Alex or Gordy or Evan would break up the fight, but they never came. Blake dug his knee into my thigh. Admit it, admit you set my science project on fire. Blake Nesbitt only lived a few blocks from me, so it had been easy to bike to his house, hop the fence into his backyard, where he'd spray painted his project and left it to dry, and light the diorama on fire. I'd felt a sense of justice watching the dinosaurs melt into puddles of plastic at the base of Blake's paper mache volcano. And even though I'd had a good reason for destroying Blake's project, a teeny tiny part of me felt guilty Colonel Musser had flunked him. Your project was probably so bad that it lit itself on fire. Okay, not that guilty. As Blake pulled back to take another swing, a meaty hand grabbed his wrist and lifted him off me. I scurried backward, sore but unbroken. Coach Barbary loomed over me and Blake, looking down on us like Zeus from Olympus, prepared to smite us with a bolt of lightning. You boys have exactly three seconds to explain what's going on, or you'll wish you'd never been born. Yeah, it was way too late for that. And that is the end of chapter one. So an all boys school with a haunted house and some mysterious voice from within the haunted house beckoning Hector in and opening doors for him. There is definitely something strange going on. And it just continues to get stranger. A lot of this book focuses on actual invisibility, but the idea too of being invisible and not really being seen by people in your family, in your school, in your life, and what that can feel like. And it also centers a lot on the idea of good and bad, and that good people can sometimes do bad things. And I really liked that about this book. I think that that complicates the narrative in a good way. You can't root for all the good characters all the time and characters that seem bad maybe are behaving badly for a reason at that time. And so it's really not what you expect from everybody. Hector's a pretty great narrator. He can be funny even when things are getting pretty dire for him. I really enjoyed reading The School for Invisible Boys by Sean David Hutchinson. And I highly recommend that you read it too. Thank you for joining me.